Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. I've read many stories about people's encounters with Bigfoot. Most of them are scary or terrifying. I've come to the conclusion these people are simply scared of the unknown or perceive the creature to be evil. When I believe it's just an animal, it's curious, smart, territorial, and even kind. This doesn't say some can't do things which would scare someone, say throw rocks or chase after people, but I believe this is just them protecting their ever-dwindling territory. My encounter story began when I was 27. I had just gotten out of the army, and instead of moving back home to Iowa, I continue living a life of adventure by moving to a small plot of land outside of Yakima, Washington. I planned on living off the land and just being alone for a while, as I needed it to process all I'd been through in Iraq. I rented an old trailer, which sat on five acres. I was surrounded by woods, and I loved it. I spent my days, this was the late spring, preparing a garden and scouting the land around. The first time I thought something was off was when I was hiking. I found some interesting tree structures, large branches, or even smaller trees uprooted and set along each other like a large cross or X's. At first, I thought nothing of them, but I found a few. I knew these weren't just created naturally. They had to be made. After the first week, I was sitting on my front porch enjoying a beer. I liked to sit in the dark and had no real light save for the waning crescent moon. As I sipped my beer, I could hear what I knew was someone slowly and diligently walking in the woods just inside the wood line near the front yard. I didn't care and just thought it could be a neighbor the closest was a mile away, walking back to their house. I literally didn't care, nor was I scared. I finished my beer and promptly went to bed. The next night, I heard the same walking. This time, I called out. The walking stopped. I said, hello, and asked if they wanted a beer. No reply, of course. Like the night before, I finished my beer and went to bed. The next day, I was in the front yard near the woods and spotted a sack of rocks on a fallen log, four to be exact, all piled on the other. This wasn't natural and was no doubt made by whoever was in the woods. I laughed and went about my day. As I prepared my dinner, I had an idea. I'd play a game. 
I'd leave something for whoever it was and see if they do the same. I don't know why I came up with this idea, but it popped into my mind. I grabbed a beer, took it down to the log and set it there, then went back and sat. About 20 minutes later, I heard the walking. I said, hello, asked how they were doing, and did nothing else. Upon walking, I was curious and went down to discover the beer was gone, and in its place was a series of twigs, all lined up by size. I laughed and was happy that the game had begun. That night, I set out an old medal I'd been awarded. I was excited to know what would be left. Like every night before, I sat on the porch, drank my beer, and could hear the walking. The next morning came, and I rushed down to find a pile of acorns. The metal was gone. I looked around to see if it were close by, but there was nothing. It was then I saw a footprint in some mud. It had rained that night. The print was large, about 14 inches and barefoot. I was taken aback at first. This wasn't a person. This was a Sasquatch. I'd heard about them, and I didn't think I was dealing with a mythical creature. But yet, I was. I did wonder if my neighbor was playing with me, so I paid a visit. He was a nice older man, like me, had served in the army but in Vietnam. He said he hadn't been walking around at night behind my house and had definitely not left anything. I didn't go into detail, but I got the sense he knew what I was dealing with. The next night came, and now I thought about leaving food. I cooked up some hamburgers and made one for it. I left it down there and went back to my spot on the porch. Like clockwork, the walking came, but this time it walked up to the edge of the woods to where the burger was. I tried to see it, but there wasn't enough light. To this day, I swear I saw a silhouette of it. I was tempted to go down, but thought it best not to and waited for morning. Upon waking, I went down to find the burger gone, and in its place were blackberries. I laughed so loud. I was having a form of communication with a Sasquatch. This back and forth continued on for weeks. I'd leave various food items, and in return I'd get berries, acorn, and even had what I think was a half-eaten squirrel. I was enjoying this and started to contemplate if I should try to get it on film. I decided against it and just wanted this experience for myself. I had an appointment at the VA come up and planned on staying overnight to visit my friend. My visit went beyond a day and lasted three. It was great seeing an old army buddy, but looked forward to coming home. When I returned, I found the trailer had been broken into. There were footprints all around, and the refrigerator and pantry had been ransacked. At first, I was pissed off, but it really was all my fault. I had been feeding this thing, and when it stopped, it went looking for me and for the food. I didn't like that. It had messed up my place, but like I said, I understood. It was my fault. These things, while intelligent, are just animals. I cleaned up the mess, fixed the door, and promptly went back to my nightly routine. For another nine months, I'd leave something and would be given an item in return. I did ask that it not come to my house again, and you know what? It never did. I never once felt fear. Then again, I'd seen what real terror was in Iraq. So a hungry animal who was smart enough to leave gifts for me didn't rank as terrifying. I wonder, whatever happened to it, and whoever is living there is enjoying the creature like I did, although I wager they aren't. On to the next one. While on a hike, on the way back, I had given a woman I had just met an antihistamine for a bee sting as she was getting an allergic reaction. 
She was fine all the way through, and then things started to get strange for everybody. Some of us were hearing noises in the bushes. Others felt terrifying fear as we came to a clearing coming upon large gravel pits. In the distance, we saw farmyards and mountains. We stopped for a moment, then turned left on the trail and continued down. This is where I heard low growling on the right of me up ahead. The trees were no longer tall, but there were shorter bushes coming in and overgrown on the trail on us. The trail forked off, and my husband proceeded to turn right toward the growling. He stopped and realized we should have gone straight, so we backtracked. The woman all of a sudden walked quickly ahead of us, leaving her husband behind. This is where I started to hear a dragging noise to the left of me. It sounded like boulders being dragged across concrete. I knew we were heading in the direction of some sort of animal or beast, but it was the only way out. The woman started talking irrationally to herself out loud. All of a sudden, she stopped, turned around, and went barreling back toward us, shouting, I have to be with my husband. She grabbed his arm. They started running back to the gravel pit. I asked the other hikers what was going on. They said the couple were headed back to the people. I said, what people? We saw no people. The other hikers said they're heading back to the pit. I felt intense fear for her because she was heading back to the direction of the heavy growling. So I quickly went back to them and everybody followed and I shouted out, there's no people back there. And they shouted back, we tried to get in there through the sand pit from the road, but we couldn't make it in. But that's how we planned to get out. They were panicked. I yelled at them, if you couldn't make it in, you won't make it out. We must follow my husband. He knows the way back to the car. All of a sudden, she laughed and calmed right down and told me she had just had a panic attack. I kept her talking as we went back toward the way out. We then came upon a gigantic tree stump with roots about five to six feet tall, lying on its side, blocking the entire path off. It seemed out of place as there were no big trees around. My husband said there were large boulders placed strategically around the stump. As we all climbed through and over, I got stuck for a second, entangled in the root. I was too afraid to look to my left, afraid I was going to be attacked by something. I got out and turned around and saw a large gaping hole dug under the tree. I was worried it was a den. Something is up with that tree. Shortly after, we came to big cliffs we needed to descend down from with ropes heading to the creek. Barreling down the left side of me, 50 feet down, something was leaping down the cliff through the trees, smashing and crashing and breaking trees. Almost all of us heard it. I said to my husband, something is down there. He said, I know, but we have to keep going. Just then, I saw this black thing flash through the trees, crossing the trail below, meeting up with the thing on the left. Later on, I found out my husband and friend had a sighting to the left of us just before the creature went crashing down the cliff. One of the hikers with us looked into the eyes and said it was a sort of light brown creature. Seconds later, her and my husband saw the same creature running on our left, light brown in color, running upright. It was the size of a skinny man, not that tall, extremely hairy with long fringed hair about six inches long on the arms. At that time, it was looking straight ahead. It was taking long leaping strides and swinging its arms. When we got down to the bottom of the creek, the rest of the group had taken off on us. The couple was gone. I was the first to get to the creek bed, and as I waited for the others to come down, the ropes, I feared I would be attacked by something. I felt very vulnerable. We all had one last large embankment to climb. There were tons of huge, smashed trees laying everywhere, huge, hundreds of years old. We kept wanting to stop to catch our breath. My husband wouldn't let us. He was at the very back of us. He said to me, if you had seen what I just saw back there, you'll understand why we need to get out of here now. 
My friend looked and said she saw it too. We needed to get out of here. We continued climbing all the while hearing a deep moaning following us and it was getting louder. When we got to the top of where it was flat, our friend Len was there. He said he did not follow the couple out of the woods. He did not reply why he had abandoned us. Even Len felt we all needed to get out of the woods. We had a 15-minute hike out. All the while, we felt docked and watched. When we got to the road and the car, we still felt we were being watched from the trees. Some of us hiking were teachers, nurses. We are all educated people and not prone to panic. We are experienced hikers and have encountered bears and cougars before, but this was different. On to the next one. In Nova Scotia, in Canada, in the summer of 1997, I had just returned home from a year working out west in Alberta. Most Maritimers head out that way for work in their teens or their early 20s. After any time away from home, I always head back to the South Mountain near Wolfville, Nova Scotia. The area has always been a special place for me with a lot of great childhood memories. The area around my grandparents' property is mostly forest, and across the road there is a brook where I had my first possible Sasquatch encounter in 1985, along with six friends. There were stories of what the people on the mountain and in the valley area called the Tramp or Hobo. Apparently, it was supposed to be a homeless man that wore animal furs and could not speak clearly and smelled really bad, did not shave, and would chase people out of the area and away from the brook. One night in the fall of 1964, 15-year-old T. Codwell was leaving the neighbor's house to go home to what is now my grandfather's property, and as she left the walkway and started out across the road, to head up the mountain, something very tall that cast a shadow across the entire road ran out in front of her and into the woodlot between the properties. The only thing she was able to tell me was that it was very tall, was across the road in just a few steps, and that it scared her so bad she ran back into the house and would not leave until the next morning and had to have someone walk her home. I also spoke to A.N.S. Allen, who told me of seeing a large black or dark brown figure on two legs in the corner of a field while baling hay. Mr. Allen called out to his wife and pointed it out to her. Coincidentally, their son was with me when I had my first rock-throwing encounter with six other kids in 85. There is also a piece of property on the mountain where most hunters will not go. The way it was described to me was that you could go there ten times and things would be fine, but the odd time, everything would go silent. The birds would not make a sound, the squirrels stopped making noises, and you just felt like something was watching you. An overall uneasy feeling, I guess, but enough to make you not want to go back. It was like someone would hit a switch off. And then, as fast as everything shut down, it came back on. This brings me to my sighting in 97. As I say, I always loved the area. It is an awesome place to hike and camp, and I always walk up the brook, never the road. Just the waterfalls make it worth the extra walk. On this day, it had been raining a few days before, so the water was flowing pretty darn good. So I had to watch my step as I would cross back and forth across the water. As I turned the corner to go up the first waterfall, I saw what I thought was a black bear with its front end in the water, so I did what I always did when I saw a bear and started to back up slowly and was ready to haul butt back up the trail to my grandparents. But this was not a bear. It stood up, turned to his left, and looked straight at me. This was not what I thought a Sasquatch looked like, as he was only about six foot and built like a light heavyweight wrestler or boxer. The hair on the chest and abdomen was black and thinner than the longer hair on the arms and legs. 
there was no point to his head, although his brow ridge was out further than a man's. His face was dark like leather around his eyes, cheeks, and some of his forehead. His nose was flat with wide nostrils. His mouth was wide with thin lips that were lighter color than the skin on his face. His neck was short. The neck muscles were visible. He stood there looking at me and only moved his head once to smell the air like what a dog does when you walk past it with food and then turned back at me. I don't know how to describe what I felt at that time other than to say it felt like I was there longer than I was, like time slowed down. It wasn't like fear. It was very odd. There was no smell from him that I noticed, and his eyes were a dark color. If I had to guess, I would say dark brown. From the expression on his face, the deep breath like a frustrated sigh as we looked at each other. It was like, I have seen you and you have seen me. Let's just leave it at that. I did not feel threatened, but I knew it was time to leave. So as he turned to his left, I turned to mine and started back down the stream. I only turned back to look at him once more and noticed that his arm was wet and and hung lower than a man, and his back hunched by the shoulders. I watched him take two steps on his way up the bank, and I turned back around and continued back to my grandparents. I did not see him look back to me at all. When I got up on the patio, I tried to light a cigarette, but I had a very hard time as I was shaking so bad. It was like being on cocaine. I sat and chain smoked for a while. The fear that I did not feel before, I sure as heck felt it now. I continued to research in northern New Brunswick for six years after talking with some of the elders on the local Mi'kmaq reservation across the river in Quebec about Sasquatch. They were kind enough to point me in the right direction, which led me to an area that, after some time, I was able to find some snow tracks and, eventually, close enough to get a few pictures. There are no reported sightings in the area that I had my encounter on Bigfoot website, and I don't imagine there will ever be, mainly because people around the area are very private and do not want attention. There are things that have happened that stay in families for generations before people find out about them. The only reason I have been able to get people talking is basically they have known me since I was a baby. I have worked for them, hung out with their kids, or are related to them. I have wondered, since my sighting, that if stories of the tramp may have actually been a Sasquatch. I don't know, but I think it's possible. On to the next one. In November of 1891, a wild-eyed individual claimed to have seen a hairy man-like varmint in the mountains near Anaconda Deer Lodge County in Montana. On to the next one. In October of 1952, at Feely Lake in Missoula County in Montana, a huge, hair-covered creature making jabbering noises was seen and heard. It was seven feet tall, covered with cinnamon-colored hair, and, oddly enough, was wearing a leather belt with a brass buckle. Lyle Slade was hunting elk when he saw what he thought was a wounded elk on the other side of a clearing. Suddenly, the creature crossed the clearing in the direction of the wounded elk. On to the next one. At Seeley Lake in Missoula County in Montana in 1959, Mr. R. W. Rye, a bear hunter, saw an eight-foot-tall Bigfoot in the woods, but did not shoot at it. On to the next one. A hairy humanoid was seen by a troop of Boy Scouts camping at Brown Gulch in Liberty County, Montana. At 4 a.m., one of the boys heard something moving outside of his tent, and he looked outside and was confronted by a man-like creature 
covered in brown hair with silver tip. The creature also had a full beard. The boy let out a terrified scream, and the animal took off into the creek, making splashing noises as well as human-like giggling noises. Human footprints were found the following day that were 20 inches long by 6 inches wide with a stride of 7 feet. On to the next one. In Missoula County in Montana, I'm 31 years old. When I was 10 or 11 years old, I was riding my horse in the summertime in a wooded area bordering the wilderness area of the Rattlesnake Wilderness in the outskirts of Missoula, Montana, and my horse stopped dead in his tracks as we rode through a meadow. There I was, face to face with a Bigfoot that was about 10 feet away from me. It was peeking out from behind a tree. It just stood there looking at me and didn't make a sound. I slowly turned my horse around and ran home. It must have stood at least seven or more feet taller than myself. That was the only time I witnessed one. In recent summer seasons, loud screams have been heard near Clark Fork River outside Missoula, usually between midnight and dawn. As of today, my husband and myself built a home in the Clark Fork River on the outskirts of Missoula, Montana. And over the last two summers, we hear an odd sort of scream that sounds almost like a prehistoric bird, really gravelly, and it travels very fast, covering a lot of ground. This sound has happened in the summertime, usually right before daybreak or right after midnight. Our neighbors have heard it too, but no one can figure out what it is. It kind of sends chills down your spine, and the neighbor's dogs start barking when they hear it. My grandparents saw one in the Swan Valley running through a river bottom near their home about 30 years ago. They are since deceased. They said it looked like a hairy man loping through the brush of the river bottom that ran in front of their home. On to the next one. In the Cherokee National Forest near Robbinsville in Monroe County, a 15-year-old boy and a friend were hiking on a trail to Slick Rock Creek to do some fly fishing. He was slightly ahead of his buddy, and 50 to 60 yards ahead of him, he saw some kind of animal that crossed the trail. It was in plain view for about 5 to 10 seconds, and then it was trotting on all fours. It was mostly white or off-white, and the size of a large bear. It looked to weigh about 400 pounds. The hair was shaggy and more shaggy than that of a bear. The height from the belly to the ground was three feet and its legs were very long. It turned and looked at the boys as it went past and had a flat face. It did not have a muzzle like a bear nor where the ears were visible. He looked at his buddy and asked if he had seen it and he said yes. The boys asked what it was and the other boy did not know. Shortly afterward, some large limbs were shaken in a tree near to them. On to the next one. At the Ruskin Cave and Jewel Cave grounds near Dixon in Dixon County, a 14-year-old girl was walking home. She had been dropped off at the locked front gate and was walking up the road to her house when a Bigfoot came up behind her and tried to take a large bag of candy from her. It bruised her back. She dropped the candy and came home literally in shock and could not describe the incident for a few minutes. While the daughter was trying to describe what happened, the mother almost blacked out when she looked out of her window and saw the Bigfoot standing there and staring at her. The mother described the creature as eight to nine feet tall with a flat face and round eyes. It was covered in coarse, bushy hair that was two to three inches long. Many witnesses in the area reported hearing strange screams in the area. On to the next one. In Dixon County, between Sycamore Road and Westfield Road in Tennessee, 
a teenage boy was frog gigging around 10.30 at night. He was headed home, and there was no moon. He walked along a ridge, down a tractor path to his house. There was a gap at the end of the wood line, and he had to cross a barbed wire fence. As he neared the gap, he was startled by something getting up from the ground no more than 12 feet away. At first, he thought that it was one of his grandpa's cows, but cows don't stand on two legs. It was black and seven and a half to eight feet tall. It scared the fool out of the witness, and it stood up and looked at him. Then it turned and took off into the woods, swinging its arms like a man. He could hear it making bipedal steps very fast. The boy ran home as fast as he could and told his mother, who told him he was crazy. The witness had hunted all his life and had excellent night vision. The creature was very muscular, with a shoulder width of four feet and weighed around 450 to 600 pounds. It did not appear to have a neck and the arms hung down below its knees. On to the next one. Friends, walking in the woods near Percy Priest Lake in Rutherford County, Tennessee, came upon a clearing where they saw a six and a half foot to seven and a half foot tall Bigfoot on the other side of the clearing. It never turned to look at them, and the witnesses quickly fled the scene. Trees had been found in the area that had been uprooted and stripped of their branches as if something was eating the leaves. Large footprints as well as wallows or bedding sites were found in the area as well. On to the next one. A 17-year-old boy driving at night near Fayetteville in Lincoln County, Tennessee, saw a large creature on Teal Hollow Road. He had an 11.30 p.m. curfew and was speeding home. As he was speeding down a straight, he saw something on the side of the road. He thought it was a deer or a cow, so he slowed down. As he got closer to it, the creature stood up. As he went past it, he was still going 55 or 60, but slowed down when he thought that it might be a person who crashed his car. He hit the brakes, but was past where it had been. He reversed back along the road and could see the creature had walked into the middle of the road behind him. When he got 25 to 30 yards from it, he realized it was bigger than a person. It scared him, so he threw the car into drive and floored it. He drove home like a bat out of hell. When he got home, he was still shaking and had tears in his eyes. The creature was big looking, about six and a half to seven feet tall, and almost half the width of his car. On to the next one. In McMinn County in Tennessee, I was 16 then, I'm 27 now, but I remember this as if it happened yesterday. I was up late reading a book by Billy Graham. My dogs had been acting up all night, barking and sometimes trying to get into the house. I lived on a ranch about 20 miles away from the Smoky Mountains. It had been raining all night, and I thought I heard a noise outside my back door, which I was facing. I looked up and didn't see anything in the porch light, so I thought it was one of the dogs scratching on the door. Suddenly, they went wild barking and going crazy, and I heard them run around to the back, and I stood up to see what was wrong, and as I stood, I saw a figure walk by my door and stop. Whatever it was, it was huge. It was taller than my door, which was seven feet high, and it was very broad and very hairy. It was a tan or dark blonde. At least, it looked that color in the porch light. It made these funny, whistling, grunting sounds. All I could see of it was its shoulders and part of its left arm. Then, all of a sudden, my light on the porch went out, and I was petrified. In the lighting, I saw it walking away, so I sort of crawled over to the door to look out, and I decided to open the door for a better look. When I did open the door, this odor hit me, gagging me. My dogs had ran under the house and wouldn't come out. I could tell they were quite scared, 
as well, because they were whining. Then lightning flashed again, and that's when I thought, about 30 feet away, just standing there, not really looking at me, but more towards the house. Then it made the weirdest noise, like a baby crying. Then it whistled again, and in the distance on up the wood, I swear I heard the exact same whistle or cry, or whatever it was. It was dark, but I could hear it crashing through the wood, and I guess it was leaving. I had moved toward the side of my door and slipped and fell on some grass and cut myself pretty bad. That's when I discovered that my porch light had been knocked out. I never saw any footprints because I had cut my knee pretty bad and had to go to the hospital. It also rained all night, and by the time I could go out and investigate, all I found was broken trees and branches, which didn't prove much because anything could have done it. I just know what I saw was no black bear. Black bears do not get that big or that broad. I heard it whistle, and off in the distance in the woods, I heard a reply, and that's when it left. It was very eerie. It also smelled like dead meat. It was just me and my dogs. Well, the Smoky Mountains were practically in my backyard. I lived on a 100-acre ranch in the mountains, or woods, I guess you could say. The High West River was about 10 miles away. The landscape was very remote and as forested as Tennessee can get. My closest neighbor was about two miles away. I was in the middle of nowhere. My grandfather used to tell me stories about a swamp monkey, though. Was this him? On to the next one. Mr. Lou Bigley, a truck driver, saw a brown, five-foot-tall Bigfoot standing in the middle of the road. On to the next one. In Billings, in Yellowstone County in Montana, Mr. Harold E. Nelson saw a huge and reddish hairy humanoid with a face more ape-like than gorilla-like peering into the door of his camper, wherein Mr. Nelson, who was inside at the time, scrambled for his gun. The creature had broad shoulders and weighed 600 to 800 pounds. It also had a pointed head and spot of white hair on the body and stood erect. They can display curiosity. In fact, curiosity is one of the hallmarks of many of the sightings, irrespective of the phenomenon. On to the next one. At Lost Trail Path in Ravalli County in Montana, a hairy humanoid was seen. At 3 p.m. one afternoon, a man cutting poles with a power saw felt he was being watched and switched off his saw. He turned and then saw a seven-foot-tall, black-haired ape-man weighing about 300 pounds, about 25 feet from him. To defend himself, he turned the saw on again. Something weird happened. As soon as the saw was on, the hair on the back of the creature's neck stood up. On turning off the saw, the hair went flat again. The creature then moved off, never keeping its eyes off the man. On to the next one. On St. Mary's Peak in the Bitterroot Mountains in Montana, two hairy humanoids were seen by Chris Tobias, Diane Stringen, Kathy Mudd, and two other university students while they were out hiking. The two creatures were black-haired and walking along a ridge. St. Mary's Peak is near Stevensville in Ravalli County in Montana. On to the next one. On the Bootlegger Trail in Cascade County, 12 miles north of Great Falls, Montana, a hairy humanoid was seen by a coyote hunter. The coyote hunter fired three times at it with his 30 30 rifle, but it kept coming at him, so he escaped in his car. The creature was seven to eight feet tall. On to the next one. In Cascade County in Montana, a hairy humanoid was seen by two girls in the afternoon. 
They had noticed that the horses in the field near their house were behaving in a strange manner, pawing at the ground and neighing. On going out to investigate, they saw a seven and a half foot tall Bigfoot, twice as wide as a man, standing 200 yards from the house. One girl looked through a rifle sight at it and described its face as dark and awful looking and not like a human's. She fired the rifle once into the air to scare it off. She fired again. Suddenly the creature fell to the ground and started to pull itself along with its arms. Then it stood up again. Then three or four other creatures appeared and helped it into the woods. The girls fled. On to the next one. In Ulm in Cascade County in Montana, two boys, 12 and 13, were south of the Ulm Bridge over the Missouri River just before noon when they saw Bigfoot. One of the boys saw a hairy arm and the other saw a tall creature with glowing whitish eyes and covered in dark brown hair. It was reported to the local sheriff's department and the boys passed a polygraph test. On to the next one. At Great Falls Airport in Cascade County in Montana, a hairy humanoid was seen by a motorist in a field beside the road. The creature was seven to nine feet tall and the witness grabbed a gun and went after it on foot. But when it turned toward him, he retreated to his car. The same witness also reported seeing gray oval UFO hovering 10 to 15 feet above the ground, approximately half a mile from the road. On to the next one. The Blackfoot. They're predominantly a northern Montana area tribe. Tree people are described to blend in and live among the trees, always relying on the tree line for cover and keeping the silhouette of the tree line as well as other objects and shadows very near their form as camouflage and to avoid detection. They are also described to travel in groups and bury their own dead. Here is some of what is recorded following an interview from a Montana hunter who knew more about the tree people. I've heard him. Down when we were up, we killed two bull elk. We were up in about, I would say, about 18 miles back in the wilderness. And I heard this. It was like it was after dark. We had a big fire going. We had just gutted them out. We hadn't skinned them or done anything with them. And all of a sudden, we hear it sounded like a seal barking and two big logs hitting each other. Kind of a hollow sound, like two big, sounded like two big logs. And I was logging for many, many years. And when two trees hit together, that's what it sounded like. Well, the sound had this seal's bark kind of sound to it. Well, from the time we heard it, that is, until it was up to where we were at. And we were at the top of the clear cut that was probably about 700 yards to the top. Probably from the time we heard the noise from the bottom until it got to the top, it was about three seconds. And then it was behind us. And behind us during the day, I couldn't see. And that's why we picked that spot, because there's grizzly bear in the area. Especially with meat down, you gotta worry about grizzly bear. So... We're back there, and the whole forest behind us is completely deadfall lying there. And these things went around and behind us without even making a sound. I mean, no click or a branch breaking. We didn't hear anything. My cousin was a Green Beret in Vietnam. You know he was in special forces, and it scared the heck out of him. He said, man, he's never heard anything like it. He opens up about an even more fascinating, somewhat detailed account. This account was of a man who claimed to have hit a Sasquatch with a loading truck. This was back in the 60s. He hit a Sasquatch with a logging truck, and he built roads for the Forest Service. Well, then he went in and they logged these areas, 
and he was driving. He drove a cat for years making road. Well, he was driving a logging truck and he hit this Sasquatch and he thought it was a bear at first and when he went back he realized what it was. It had human features to it and he went back to get back on the CB radio because back then they had CB radios and by looking at it he thought it was dead and by the time he got back, got in his truck and had the CB calling back to the base to tell him what had happened that he'd killed something that looked like a man. By the time he got back, it was gone. Which means they travel in group and carry their own dead away is what we think. And they can see you and you would have no idea that they're there. Some of the Native American Indian tribes say you'll never see the animal and it stops there. That's because the Bigfoot sense you going to look that way. See what I'm saying? They have a sense of knowing the direction you're going to look, I believe. Well, a lot of people say it's like a shadow, and then you get these things where you're driving late at night and you know you see the shadow of the trees turning in directions as your car is turning around a corner, and you know literally one of those shadows in theory could be a Sasquatch. Well, they just seem to blend in with the trees. The First Nations, they call them the tree people. It's like you'll never see him step out into an area where they have no background and distinctive silhouette surrounding their form. They're always within something that's hiding them. They know that they're black like a shadow. They're very intelligent and they play into that way of thinking. I talked with R.S. a moment about the observations of Bigfoot Sasquatch footprints that people have noticed in areas where they were doing consistent day after day activities. After a consecutive number of days of having gone to the same location, such activities include logging, road building, construction, forestry service, park maintenance, camping, hunting, and fishing, just to name a few. After having gone to an area for a consistent number of days, a predictable pattern, say five days a week, a person may notice a giant man-like footprint or partial footprint as many of the reports also seem to suggest, if the individuals occupied some of the same areas in a Bigfoot or Sasquatch range. I go on to mention the subtle nature of Bigfoot Sasquatch, which may also involve such behavior as object leaving as a form of communication, and quite possibly the intentional leaving behind of its footprint that indicate that it is territorial and occupies the same area as whatever individual that is trying to get this point across to. Based on some of the observations by Professor Grover S. Grant in his 1992 book, Big Footprint, the footprint or footprint may also sometimes be left on purpose by Sasquatch to remind someone to leave an area without there being an actual conflict over the issue of territory. That's when R.S. had related another shocking story to me about a man who had actually been abducted by a Sasquatch. Abduction of humans sometimes does based on other accounts through North America's history as well as Native American First Nation legends and stories fall into the possible profiled behavior pattern of the animal known more commonly today as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. There are probably about 10 or more other documented accounts throughout North America's history that indicate the same sort of behavior pattern that Sasquatch apparently sometimes abduct people for whatever reason. The Himalayas also hold stories of the Yeti abducting people as well. Another abduction account was documented by J.W. Burns' edition of Wide World Magazine from a story titled What Happened to Seraphine Long? This was an account of a young Native American woman that had been abducted by a young male Sasquatch back in 1871 when she was still a young woman. She said that she was made to live with him and both of his parents for approximately one year. She was then later taken back to her people by the young male. She had also, according to the article, later given birth to a half-human, half-Sasquatch baby. Sadly, soon after she had given birth, the baby had died as a stillborn. From the same article written by J.W. Burns, 
is another abduction report he had gathered. This is a Harrison Valley, B.C. hunter's story. A man named Charlie Victor of an apparently abducted feral white boy who had been cared for by a female Sasquatch while in a tree seven feet above the ground. The young boy reportedly could have been rescued by the hunter upon his inspection of the tree, but the boy jumped from the tree while attempting to make an escape. The boy then reportedly made yells to locate his wild friend among the forest. She then shows up, rather upset, and acknowledges the hunter fiercely. The hunter is able to communicate with her as if pleading, and then actually let go. Who knows, maybe in some cases, Sasquatch like keeping people around pet. There is yet another abduction story from among the Modoc tribe of a young Native American man who suffered a rattlesnake bite deep in the forest near Tool Lake in Northern California, very near the Oregon border. As the rest of his party leaves to get help, and he is finally left all alone, a male Sasquatch then picks him up and carries him to a den where a small group of these creatures then treat the young man's snake bite. The young man is then brought back by the Sasquatch to the same location where the rescue party is then able to locate and retrieve him. This, there is a story in the book, They Walked Among Us, written by Ed Fuchs, of a Wenatchee Indian man who had been kidnapped by Choanito, the Wenatchee name for Bigfoot and Sasquatch, which means night people, while out near Wenatchee Lake in Washington State. He was made to live with these creatures through the winter, yet he was brought back again in springtime to his familiar surrounding. According to the man's account, they had treated him well. He also said, as quoted, they were like a different tribe of Indians. Parallel circumstances relevant to strange disappearances at Wenatchee Lake may also be found in the book Missing 411, Western United States and Canada by David Pallades. One of the final subchapters of the book, titled Scary Events, details instances where the screams of missing persons were heard by witnesses before the person had actually disappeared. In this portion of the book, there are seven instances of young people having screamed before they had disappeared. Of these seven instances, six individuals were under the age of seven years old, two two-year-old, two three-year-old, one five-year-old, and one seven-year-old. The one individual who was way outside of this age group was an 18-year-old woman who disappeared after screaming near an area of what the book notes as swamps next to the mountain. As Pallades states in the book based on the circumstances, it's a rational assumption that they were confronted with something they could not overcome, and they were deathly afraid. As far as parallel occurrences relative to strange disappearances at Wenatchee Lake, there is also the story of a two-year-old child named Jimmy Duffy, who had also went missing near that very location, also mentioned in the Scary Events chapter of Missing 411, Western United States and Canada. His parents were checking out the perimeter to the surrounding forest as he was asleep under a camper shell of a truck until his parents had heard him screaming. His parents ran to the truck to check on him, but he was gone, never to be seen again. What happened to poor little Jimmy Duffy and how he had disappeared is still a mystery, as are so many other cases of missing persons in the first two Missing 411 books by David Pallades. Yet, based on so many other parallel, historic, resurgent suggestions of Bigfoot Sasquatch having kidnapped people, it actually seems to be a plausible and likely scenario. Is this a continuation of the same pattern which so many Native American stories also seem to suggest? How would it just dead end nowhere? That doesn't seem very real or very logical at all. We have to ask ourselves the question, what causes a person to scream before they just randomly disappear in a forested setting? Bigfoot or Sasquatch would seem to be the most likely scenario based on Native American First Nation legend and some of the scenarios in question. Then this apparently is a profiled characteristic to the creature in question that it does abduct people. 
To those who have never heard of historical accounts of Bigfoot Sasquatch behavior, the idea of this creature abducting people must sound like foolhardy nonsense. I'll admit, I was a little taken aback and rather entertained the first time I had heard the Albert Othman account, one of the most widely documented and publicized accounts written about in any number of books on the subject of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. However, there are a number of cases of just such behavior that are very much on the book, so to speak, from a variety of sources and with a great sort of detail in a number of these accounts. There are enough historically documented accounts that I've read about to where I not only accept but expect and have become quite numb and ill to the idea that Bigfoot and Sasquatch may actually abduct people. The idea that a Bigfoot or Sasquatch abducts people is something scary. That comes with an instinct that tells us deep inside ourselves it's more real than what any of us could have expected or it's more real than the information we certainly don't know enough about. Until we do research, that is. Then we may just find ourselves asking, hey, why hadn't I known about this in the first place? R.S. goes on to explain more of the following details on the Blackfoot First Nation man who, according to him, was abducted. Well, it's like Butch. When he was young, he said he was up hunting. They were up hunting for the old bear trap. This was in San Ignacio Mountain. Butch was a friend of mine. He's an old First Nation shaman. He's the high priest to the Blackfoot tribe in Polson, Montana. He said when he was young, they used to go up into the San Ignacio Mountain Range because there were old bear traps up there that the old trappers used to take up there on mules. Well, during this time period, there was a real bad snow that year, and the trapper died up there. He was eating his mules to survive. Well, he ended up dying, and all those traps were up there. And they, Butch and the other members of his party, were going up there when they were teenagers, you know, getting these big grizzly bear traps because they could get a $1,000 apiece for these traps. So, while he was up there, him and his brother, he sprained his ankle. His brother went back down to get a horse, bring it up to him to get him out of there. He says a Sasquatch came along, picked him up, put him on his shoulders. Yeah, picked Butch right up. He's like 20 years old, maybe weighing 160 pounds. He put Butch on his shoulders and he said by the direction he was going and the speed, he figures they traveled about five miles in about 25 minutes. And he said he took him to a cave and in that cave were young ones, females, and it was just like a First Nation tribe. And because Butch is First Nation, he could only communicate with them through integrated sign language because he couldn't understand what they were saying. So, after a while, he was there for a day, he said, for night. The Sasquatch picked him up, carried him back to his brother, who was waiting with a horse, and he went on home. But that was his story. On to the next one. Known as disappearing trails, these occur when whole sets of Sasquatch or Bigfoot prints simply vanish in soil or muck that had not ended itself. From Stan Gordon, some of the initial occurrences that caught our attention were cases where trails of odd footprints with large strides would be observed over a distance in various ground conditions, then suddenly stop and vanish. Over the years, this has also been seen in fresh, heavy snow. There were no other tracks around and no evidence of a hoax. There is a comment I recall from one witness from a 1973 Bigfoot wave. The man was a non-believer in Bigfoot until he had one standing only feet away from his mobile home. The witness was terrified when he called the state police to report the close encounter with the creature. The fellow had cut his lawn that evening, and the creature left its 14-inch long track in the fresh-cut grass and on its patio where it was observed. In one area, the tracks ended abruptly. 
The witness, after seeing that the tracks had just stopped, asked me if these creatures could fly, since what he saw was so unnatural. In a world where these creatures share so much in common with fairies, extraterrestrials, witches, ghosts, and spirits, are flying Bigfoot so absurd? Perhaps Sasquatch can levitate. Here are a few examples of disappearing trails from around the United States. In January 1978, a bizarre set of footprints manifested in the Hillsamere property near York, Pennsylvania. An astonishing 2,003 toed tracks, each measuring 16 inches long and 6 inches wide, crisscrossed the family's farmland. These terminated in the woods of the Hillismere Patriarch in the middle of a field. The creature had to backtrack in its own steps. Several trackways found during the Rome, Ohio sightings of summer of 1981 ended abruptly. In many areas, a human footprint could be found, as nobody had really been out up through this area, wrote Dennis Vichilis. Many of these creatures' footprints were on virgin ground, no other type of print around for a great distance. At 11.45 p.m. on March 28, 1987, Green Mountain Falls, Colorado resident Dan Mathias observed these creatures running down the road in front of my house, which at one point is 30 feet from my front window. The hairy, ape-like humanoids swung their arms in a pendulum motion as they trudged through the freshly fallen snow. News of Mathias' sighting emboldened the other area witnesses to speak up, many of them claiming the creature's trackway through the snow vanished in mid-stride. During his tenure as a newspaper reporter in the late 1980s, Chas Clifton interviewed a man who said two creatures had walked past his house and left footprints in the snow. The large tracks just ended abruptly in the fresh powder. In one example with complicated implications, researcher Peter Brine was called upon to examine a trackway found by Paul Freeman. After examining approximately a hundred prints along a ridgeline, Brine determined that the track started and ended abruptly. Brine sarcastically congratulated Freeman on his discovery of the first flying Bigfoot. While Freeman remains a controversial figure, both Grover Krantz and Jeffrey Meldron supported at least some of his finds, calling into question whether or not Brian mistook genuine, if paranormal, footprints for a hoax. In the 1990s, law enforcement officer from Box Elder County, Utah, allegedly followed a set of large bear footprints into a farmer's field one winter. The tracks simply disappeared in the middle of the property without any apparent turnaround. In March of 2014, investigators discovered a quarter-mile Bigfoot trackway near Crow Point, New Mexico. Each print measured 18 by 6 inches, with a 5 to 6 foot stride. The Navajo Rangers and Navajo Criminal Investigations had previously examined the track line and noted that the print abruptly ended, wrote Lon Strickler of the Phantoms and Monsters blog. From the witness statement, these officials were freaked out when this irregularity was seen. Southeastern researcher Jeffrey Teagle followed 16 to 18 inch tracks on multiple occasions in various locations where they abruptly ended. The most memorable of these times was when I followed a set of prints into an alfalfa field near Valley, Alabama. It was a most beautiful day the sun was out and I was on the chase. Near midfield, the track suddenly stopped without warning. So, imagine my surprise when I'm standing there with gear in hand, looking a quarter of a mile in either direction at wide open space. Valley has experienced its share of UFO sightings as well. Sometime later, Teagle found solitary tracks in Tennessee only to find his camera suddenly sapped of power as a large black hulk of a thing observed him. Researcher Colleen O'Hara, Epperly, 
described a Bigfoot trackway found by two snowshoers near Scout Mountain, Idaho. The couple followed the trail of tracks for several hundred yards. Then, all of a sudden, the tracks ended without explanation. The couple was so frightened they abandoned camp and snowshoed back to their vehicle in the middle of the night. In January 2018, Dan Gordon was shown a series of large footprints in fresh snow from North Huntington Township, Pennsylvania, each 16 inches long, with a four to five foot stride. The family was startled because the tracks seemed to just suddenly appear in the yard with no entrance point, then continued on about 70 feet across the yard, Gordon wrote. The tracks continued until they reached a play area for children and then suddenly just stopped and vanished. In Bigfoot, Anne Slate and Alan Berry describe how one trackway curiously ended. While the footsteps began among boulders and high brush, they terminated in the direction of a spring where the soil was soft and mushy. Anything heavy should have left additional impression even allowing for the creature's apparent speed and gigantic step. There was, however, nothing to be found. Another story from Barry describes disappearing tracks of a different variety, ones which literally vanished. After locating six of the most clearly defined footprints they had ever seen at a location in Southern California's Big Rock Campground, Two researchers were ready to proudly share their discovery with a skeptical Forestry Service employee named Doc. The researchers had been waiting for an exemplary set of tracks to share so they wouldn't make jackasses out of themselves. Upon reaching the site, the tracks were gone. Like Bigfoot came right back and picked them up, one researcher said. Rich and I stared at the ground where they had been, feeling like a couple of jerks. Flesh and blood hypothesis advocates prefer a host of rational explanations for such trickerish activity outlined below. Students of folklore, however, will immediately recognize disappearing trails as a hallmark of other world denizens. America's famed Jersey Devil was notoriously untrackable because its footprints would simply stop. Paths of fairy footprints mysteriously terminated. Caped intruders and large wolves left behind disappearing trails in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, and at Utah's Skinwalker Ranch, respectively. One of the most famous cases of an abruptly ending trackway took place in England in February of 1855, though it did not appear to involve any large hairy hominids. Residents of East and South Devon awoke to discover a trail of hoof marks in the freshly fallen snow, all in a straight line. The trail was estimated to stretch between 40 and 100 miles and mounted a variety of inaccessible locations, walls, roofs, enclosed courtyards, etc., in addition to open fields. The tracks would occasionally end abruptly and reappear some distance away. While not in the shape of a human foot, the inline gate and ability to vanish and return is evocative of modern Bigfoot trackways. Popular skeptical explanations include distorted tracks from rodents, badgers, an errant kangaroo, or shackles trailing from an escaped balloon, none of which seemed particularly possible. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!